Hello, everyone. We're going to just give it a few more moments to let people enter the room. And we'll get started here in just a moment. Okay, I, I think let's go ahead and get started. So good morning uh, and welcome. I'm Khaled Al-Gindi. I'm the director uh, for the program on Palestine and Palestinian Israeli affairs at the Middle East Institute. And I'm very pleased uh, to be uh, co-hosting today's event uh, entitled Gaza, Israel and the 2023 war. Are there any red lines uh, with my friend and colleague, Lara Friedman, president of the Foundation for Middle East Peace. Uh, we are honored uh, and grateful to have uh, a really extraordinary lineup of experts uh, this morning. I'll introduce them here briefly, and you can check out their full bios on the event page uh, for FMEP and for MEI. Uh, Jamil Dakwar, uh, human rights lawyer and adjunct professor uh, at New York University and Hunter College. Uh, welcome. Uh, next, uh, we have uh, Catherine Gallagher, Senior Staff Attorney at the Center for Constitutional Rights. And third, uh, Dr. Roz Siegel, uh, Associate Professor of Holocaust and Genocide Studies and Endowed Professor in the Study of Modern Genocide at Stockton University. Uh, a few housekeeping items before we get started. Uh, the format will be uh, straightforward uh, Q&A discussion between uh, us and the panelists. Uh, we'll go until about 11.15. Um, uh, it, uh, it is being recorded and live streamed, uh, so you can always check back afterwards uh, if you uh, have to leave early. Um, questions, uh, we, are, we welcome your questions. Please submit them uh, through the Q&A feature at the bottom of your Zoom window. Uh, and you can do so at any time and we'll, uh, at, during the discussion, and we'll try to get to as many questions as we can or just simply integrate them into our own questions. Um, please keep an eye out also on the chat box. Um, our colleagues behind the scenes will be uh, inserting very useful links and resources uh, based on the discussion, including many of the works of our panelists. Uh, and finally, please note that we have uh, enabled the closed captioning function so you can read the discussion as well. Uh, and now I'll turn over to my uh, Co-moderator, Lara Friedman. Thanks, Khaled. And thanks everyone who's joining us today. We're gonna just run through some very quick background before we get started. I don't wanna waste people's time. Most people know what's happening. Very quickly, in the wake of the October 7th terrorist attack by Hamas that killed some 1400 Israelis and in which more than 200 Israelis uh, civilians were taken as hostages to Gaza and also non-Israelis, the Biden administration has offered unqualified full-throated support for Israel's, quote, right to self-defense in its more than three-week-long now military assault on the Gaza Strip, aimed ostensibly at eradicating Hamas and freeing the hostages. So far, these actions have killed more than 9,000 Palestinians in the Gaza Strip, most of whom are civilians, and more than 3,800 children among them. It has damaged or destroyed an estimated 45% of homes and civilian infrastructure throughout the Gaza Strip. And it has forced the internal displacement of more than 1.4 million people. Since the start of the war, Israel has completely cut off food, water, fuel, and medical supplies to Gaza, and of late has blacked out communications to the best of its ability to and from the Gaza Strip. Taken together, Israel's actions have produced what UN officials describe as a, quote, humanitarian catastrophe and have raised fears about ethnic cleansing and genocide. The Biden administration has largely avoided laying down any clear markers or quote unquote red lines that would limit Israel's military conduct. This absence of red lines and apparent acquiescence to an Israeli military doctrine that absolves Israel of both agency and responsibility for harming civilians raises profound questions regarding the human, moral, political, and legal and diplomatic costs of the current war, as well as the legal and moral obligations of the US and international community. So with that as background, we're going to dive right in. And I'm going to start with the first question for Raz. So Raz, let's start with the horrific attack by Hamas on October 7th, um, which as we said, killed more than 1400 Israelis um, and, and also foreigners. 
The attack was widely condemned by governments across the world as a brutal act of terrorism. But terrorism itself is not a universally accepted concept in international law. So can you start off by describing what Hamas did that day from a legal standpoint? Thank you so much. Um, I think it's uh, uh, very clear uh, to me and to many that uh, the Hamas attack on 7th of October constituted a mass murder. Um, it was, I think, quite clearly a constituted war crimes and also uh, crimes against humanity, uh, uh, I think, if you think about uh, acts of torture, for example, um, uh, taking of hostages. Uh, so there's no uh, uh, there's no doubt uh, uh, in my mind, uh, as I see it, about the uh, criminal uh, character of the Hamas attack on uh, 7th of October, which shocked uh, 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 Israel and many people around the world, uh, and rightly so, uh, uh, this criminal uh, attack. Um, I'd like to emphasize here that uh, in a piece that I published in The Guardian, I even called uh, to put the people who planned the attack and the perpetrators on trial. Um, I do want to say, though, in this uh, uh, context, that, uh, as you said, terrorism is not an international uh, legal concept uh, uh, in that sense. But there is a way now that the Hamas attack is described beyond uh, issues of international law uh, in Israel, but also in the West, as an attack by Nazis basically, and the uh, description um, of, uh, of this is basically related uh, to the Holocaust. Um, and this is, uh, first of all, a complete uh, uh, falsehood, right? This, uh, uh, this association of the Hamas attack uh, with Nazis. We've seen President Biden arrive in Israel and descri describe it in this way, associated directly with uh, the Holocaust, describe it as pure, unadulterated evil, um, the other day, we heard a congressman in the U.S. Uh, um, caution us not to think about uh, innocent Palestinians, because would we think about innocent Nazis? Um, Holocaust and Nazi imagery is everywhere in Israel's social uh, media and in the media um, uh, itself. Um, this is very, very uh, dangerous. It's a crude uh, 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 misuse and abuse of Holocaust memory. It's an organization of Holocaust memory. And the, prob the big problem with it, of course, is that um, it completely blurs and distorts uh, contexts. Uh, the context of uh, uh, Jews during World War II is a powerless, stateless people facing one of the most powerful states at the time, Nazi Germany and many other allied states and the attack against them. Whereas uh, the context here, of course, is a powerful state, Israel, with a powerful army backed by all the uh, Western powers, um, and we have stateless, powerless Palestinians. Um, so this is very important to note in, in, in terms of the way that the Hamas attack is described. None of this takes away from the horrific nature and the criminal nature of the Hamas attack on 7th of October. But if we're talking about how to describe it in international terms, but also in this kind of decontextualized uh, 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 way that we see in Israel and in the West as Nazis in the frame of the Holocaust, and it's very important to call this out, uh, to note that it's simply false in terms of thinking about context. And it's also incredibly dangerous. And I might say more about this later. Thanks, Roz. Um, Catherine, I, I'd like to come to you next. Uh, in response to the attack, Israel declared war on Hamas, uh, invoking Article 51 of the UN Charter, which affirms member states' right uh, to self-defense uh, in the case of an armed attack. Uh, the United States, uh, most European nations and other leaders uh, declared unequivocal uh, support for Israel's right to defend itself. That said, there is also general understanding that the right to self-defense is not unlimited. Um, what are the rules in broad terms uh, that define what a state can and cannot do in the context of self-defense and uh, within the framework of international law? Well, thank you, and, and thank you for putting together this very important webinar um, and, and for inviting me to be part of it. 
this is a, such a, a painful and difficult moment. So I'm glad to be in community with all of you discussing what are really critical issues. Um, on the issue of self-defense, there are a couple of ways to answer this question. And, and first is to start with what the UN Charter puts forward in Article 51 is not a blank check. For any state that has been attacked by another state or has been attacked, um, there are rules for self-defense. And those rules are proportionality, distinction, and precaution as minimums. And what those mean, first and foremost, the principle of distinction, when responding to an attack, a state must distinguish between combatants and civilians. And by civilians, I mean civilians. I don't mean innocent civilians or good civilians or civilians we like. Yes, this is language that has creeped into the, the body of international humanitarian law in the post 9-11 period. Civilians are protected and they lose that protection only when they're directly participating in hostilities. So the first thing that a, a state must do in any response to an attack is to abide by the rules of proportion, uh, the principle of distinction, and it cannot target civilians. And I think we'll talk about this more, but what we see over the last three plus weeks is an attack that is directed against the civilian population in, in Gaza. Um, the principle of proportionality means that the response has to be measured. The scale, the scope, the effects have to be measured against what the attack was. When you have indiscriminate attacks and sending massive bombs that cannot distinguish between a civilian object or a military object, that is a unlawful uh, use of force. Before we even get though to those fundamental principles of proportionality, necessity, distinction, which must govern any response, there is a question that needs to be asked. And we hear continually that Israel has a right for self-defense in response to what happened on October 7th. But there is a context that we need to put that into it, not a, a justification, an excuse. There is, I agree, no doubt that crimes, war crimes were committed on October 7th by Hamas against civilians in Israel and continue to be with the taking of hostages. That is not up for debate. But there is a context of a prolonged belligerent occupation of the Gaza Strip. Israel has been occupying the West Bank, including Jerusalem, East Jerusalem, and Gaza since 1967. And over the course of this prolonged belligerent occupation, it has also instituted a 16-year closure on Gaza. And so in that context, Israel has control, effective control in legal terms over the Gaza Strip. And when a state is in the position of occupier, the, the rules of self-defense under Article 51 of the UN Charter are different. They do not apply because it is not another state, a foreign state that has attacked Israel. It is an occupied people. Now, again, you have to judge the legality or illegality of that response and that use of force and that attack by an occupied people or their, or their armed military wing. Um, but it is, it is a different analysis when you're looking at a situation of occupation, which is what we have in the Gaza Strip. And so what we hear continually about Israel's right of self-defense under Article 51 is contrary to what we see in the, the law of the International Court of Justice. Thanks, Catherine. That actually leads me quite elegantly into, elegantly into my question for Jamil. Jamil, I want you to talk about the historical perspective a little bit more, um, the context in which this Hamas attack took place, which is, again is not to justify anything, but is to remind people that October um, 7th wasn't the, the beginning of, of time. But more important, I think, how are to talk about how Israel's actions in Gaza and today are different from what we've seen in the numerous previous military engagements that Israel has had in Gaza. Thank you uh, for this opportunity and and uh, 
I also want to just uh, uh, emphasize that I'm speaking in my personal capacity, uh, not in my professional capacity as an ACLU staff member. Um, I also want to thank uh, both Raz and, and Katie for their uh, opening remarks, because I very much agree with them, uh, both on the uh, gravity of the violations that are committed um, the atrocities, I would say, committed on October 7th, particularly against Israeli civilians. And there were also uh, non-Israeli civilians that impacted as well, uh, foreign workers who were there. Actually, not all of them were also Jewish Israelis. They were Arab. Uh, but the, that in of itself um, was the a moment that um, that I, I thought when, when that happened is that it was clearly not only a, a serious violations of that uh, distinction between civilians and combatants, but it was important to, uh, to emphasize the importance of defending humanity at all times, even in the darkest times. And what, what we've seen since October 7th is, um, is really, uh, as we will discuss more, uh, uh, violating and um, a blatant violation of all any rules that uh, attempt to minimize the um, the damage to particularly civilians and civilians infrastructure. Um, I think that the, what's important to to emphasize as well at the at the outset is that the context for what the Hamas fighters and as an organization, as an armed group, as well as others who joined on October 7th, is a context of not just, Katie mentioned, military occupation, but the fact that the people who are living in Gaza historically are uh, being uprooted and displaced during 1948 war of the Nakba for the Palestinians, the mass displacement and ethnic cleansing. In fact, 75% uh, of, of Gazans are either refugees or descendants of the refugees of 1948. They have, <clears throat> excuse me, they have uh, for decades been under a strict regime, uh, military regime that have imposed a blockade, restricting any movement in, in and out. Israel has full control of what happens in the Strip. It has a full control over the civil registry of Who's, who lives in Gaza, who is a resident in Gaza. They have control of what gets into Gaza. Before October 7th, there were about five, only 500 trucks of aid that goes into Gaza, mainly from Rafah. And as we know, this has been uh, stopped, uh, in complete, in completely shut down, and only recently, because of international pressure, opened for few trickling humanitarian aid. Uh, there has been a suffocating blockade that has been called as in cruel and inhumane that violated international uh, law, particularly because it's an impact on uh, the civilian population. Um, and so there was uh, a, a continuing violations of international humanitarian law and human rights law in, in that context that had been happening just in the Gaza Strip in terms of the way that the, the Isra Israel has imposed um, its, its uh, severe restrictions on movement and obviously, over the years, there were military operations conducted that killed thousands of Palestinians, and many of them uh, were civilians. Uh, as a, in addition to that, we have to take into account what was going on in the West Bank and East Jerusalem as also uh, uh, occupied territory, uh, where there had been an escalation of a particular last year or two uh, of Israeli policies of targeting civilians, targeting sacred sites, including Muslim and Christian sites in, in Jerusalem, in particular, Al-Aqsa Mosque compound. The right-wing government under Netanyahu has clearly had made clear what its goals are. Um, and so there was all these series of things that are happening. Um, and yet that obviously does not justify in any way or fashion the attack on non-combatants, on civilians. And so that's a really, had to, we have to make it very clear. And we also have to make, make it very clear that under international law, there is a right to resist foreign occupation. But uh, as I laid out in my article in the nation, those, the right to resist foreign occupation and engage in, in all forms of resistance 
has to be confined or had to be within the confines of international law that particularly emphasizes the protection of civilians, the not targeting of non-combatants and other uh, prohibitions, including not taking civilian hostages. Uh, that clearly was violated on October 7. And I think that what we have seen as a result of that is a, an act reaction and actions, extend, extending uh, Israeli actions in the, in the Gaza Strip in particular that we have never seen before. And if I may just say, highlight a few things about that action. One is the fact that it appears that there were um, no, while there were some lip service paid to the protection of civilians, it was clear that the, the, the goal of this, uh, of this uh, uh, attack on what I call the uh, genocidal attack campaign in, in Gaza is really a revenge Re, uh, for the attacks on civilians and military uh, installations and also soldiers who were killed on October 7th. It's to restoring um, Israeli military might and deterrence capabilities and uh, creating the, uh, the, uh, the, um, the conditions for a new conditions for, for the Israeli uh, domination of the Gaza in not under Hamas. So while the, the goal that stated in the beginning was disseminated, disseminating, disseminating Hamas, and it's, uh, it's then it was uh, changed, tweaked to disseminating its military infrastructure. Um, I think it's really important to what does that mean? Because I think that the, the way that has been framed as attack on, on Hamas infrastructure and military capability uh, clearly went uh, beyond that. It went to uh, attacking civilians' infrastructure, civilian uh, populations, including hospitals, schools, UN facilities, and the vast enforced mass mass uh, 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 displacement of Palestinians uh, from mainly from the north of the Gaza Strip to the south. This is for the first time that Palestinians are put in a position where in the Gaza Strip that uh, there is nowhere nowhere in the in the Gaza Strip is safe. And if they, there's nowhere that they can seek safe haven because safe haven in the Egyptian peninsula, we can talk more about that, is essentially a second Nakba. And there is no ability for them to go back to return to their homeland uh, to seek safe haven inside Israel, which is something that Israel has restricted for over 75 years. Uh, thanks, Jamil. That actually um, is a is a perfect segue to uh, our next question for for Raz. Um, so, on the one hand, Israeli leaders say that they are doing their best to minimize civilian casualties. Uh, they make phone calls. They drop leaflets. Uh, they've ordered the evacuation of the entire northern Gaza Strip, for example, all of which are uh, assumed to be uh, for humanitarian purposes. Um, on the other hand. We know um, uh, that Israeli military doctrine, sometimes called the Dahya Doctrine, uh, so named for the Beirut neighborhood that was flattened by uh, Israeli forces in 2006, is based on the use of overwhelming and, importantly, disproportionate use of force uh, against the attackers and also, very importantly, their hosts. The attackers in this case, of course, being Hamas, um, and the hosts being the civilian population of Gaza, because Gaza is not a state. Uh, this is how uh, one Israeli major general described this model, and I'm, I'm quoting, what happened in the Dahya quarter will happen in every village from which Israel is fired on. We will apply disproportionate force on it and cause great damage and destruction there. From our standpoint, there are not they are not civilian villages, they are military bases. So already we have a kind of built-in lack of distinction uh, between civilians and uh, combatants. Um, how does this fit uh, within the, the framework of, uh, of the laws of war and, and to, to Raz? And, and based on this doctrine, are there any discernible red lines that Israel might have that, that you can see? I mean, uh, quite clearly, it doesn't fit 
uh, within any laws of war, right? Um, um, and I, I, I want to stress here something that's quite striking, right, that we're seeing actually across the board. We're seeing Israeli senior army officers from the beginning of Israel's assault on Gaza admit publicly to war crimes, at least to war crimes, right, publicly. Um, so this doesn't require, you know, significant interpretation, right, uh, of any kind. Um, and what the quote that you just uh, read, Khaled, uh, is uh, one such example. I also want to say, actually, that I think that the words we use to describe what's going on around us are very, very important. I'll talk a bit later about how I see Israel's attack as genocide. Uh, but this is not a war actually, right? We need to speak in the language of state violence, right? Of mass violence. This is not a war. This is beyond any red lines that we can think about. I mean, let, let's look at the at some of the uh, data according to Israel itself. So we're talking about 20,000 tons of explosives that's been dropped on Gaza so far. That's 1.5 uh, 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 more, to times more, than the atomic bomb dropped on Hiroshima, okay? Um, it's not by accident at all that uh, Gaza uh, now looks like Ukrainian cities, right, after Rus Russian bombings and attacks, right? This is beyond any kind of red lines that we can imagine. Now we're talking about uh, um, hundreds of thousands of destroyed buildings uh, across the Gaza Strip. More than half of the buildings in the Gaza Strip have been destroyed and turned, whole areas have been become basically uninhabitable. Uh, more than 200 uh, schools have been targeted, dozens of them destroyed. Uh, 47 mosques, three churches. Um, uh, Israel has used weapons such as white phosphorus bombs, as documented by Human Rights Watch. I invite the listeners and viewers to Google and to check white, what white phosphorus bombs are and what they do. Uh, 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 this is all uh, taken together, right? Shows us clearly that this is beyond any red lines. Uh, uh, this is not a war. This is a genocidal attack against the civilian population, against the defenseless population. Uh, and it's also an intensification and an escalation of a long process as we, uh, uh, as both of you, uh, Katie and Jamil uh, said, of a long process of Israeli mass violence and state violence against Palestinians also in Gaza. So we have to also remember that this doesn't begin as we said on 7th of October, right? But we have to, describe what we're seeing in front of our eyes because Israeli army officers are describing for us what we're seeing in front of our eyes, right? Uh, so this is not war, this is beyond any red lines. Thank you, Raz. Catherine, I wanna to move to you. Um, you spoke earlier about Hamas and the illegality under national law, what Hamas did on October 7th. I want to ask you to address some of the, the things that we hear the most often in when Israel is defending its actions in Gaza. I want you to talk under international law, what about the accusation that Hamas is using human shields? What about the accusation that they are setting up headquarters, operations under hospitals and schools? The Israeli framing suggests that because of these things, anybody who dies, any civilian who dies, if they are legitimately civilians, the, the responsibility of it sits with Hamas and not with Israel for dropping the bomb. Can you discuss that? I think I'll start that question where, where Raz left off, and that's what has actually happened in Gaza in the last three weeks. And I think it's equally important to, to also add in the military assaults that we saw in 2008-9, Operation Cast Lead, in 2012, in 2014, Operation Protective Edge, uh, again in, in 2018 when there were attacks on the Great March of Return, um, and in 2021. And we saw thousands of civilians killed, and we saw UN reports that documented 
that hospitals, schools, civilian infrastructure was targeted under the same kinds of reasoning that we're being told now, Hamas is there, it's Hamas's fault. Hamas may be a, or the military wing of Hamas that is directly participating in hostilities may be a legitimate military target when it is directly participating in hostilities. Um, Hamas is, of course, and I'm not the expert on Hamas. I, I would I would commend people to the work of Tar Tarek Bak Bakoni, who has written a lot on Hamas. It is more than just the military wing. I think that's important to say. But for these places that are civilian structures, whether it's homes, whether it's hospitals, whether it's schools and, and mosques and churches, these are protected under international humanitarian law. And the principles of distinction and the principles of proportionality do not go out the door. And we suddenly say, because the Gaza Strip is one of the most densely populated places on earth and Hamas is present there, everywhere is a place that can be bombed with massive bombs that don't discriminate between civilians and military targets that um, hospitals, because Israel says Hamas may be there, we can bomb when there are 60,000 people inside receiving life-saving care under profoundly difficult situations where there is no electricity, no fuel, no water, no food coming in. Um, the, the bombs that would be dropped and are being dropped on civilian infrastructure, on healthcare professionals, on schools, on civilians. Those bombs are being dropped by Israel. And it is Israel who has to um, bear responsibility when the principles of distinction and proportionality are breached. And likewise, to the extent that Hamas attacks civilians, Hamas has to be held accountable, the military wing of Hamas. Can I just, just a quick follow-up just to get on the record. What about the argument that we hear, including from Alan Dershowitz yesterday or the day before, that there are no innocent, like, well, I don't want to, these are not his words exactly, but this concept that there are no innocent civilians in Gaza, they voted for Hamas, they support Hamas. What does international law say about the status of civilians based on voting habits of their parents or previous generations or alleged sympathies via polling or anything else? No, you, you can't target a civilian population. That is one of two crimes. It's either a crime against humanity or it's genocide. If you are taking a group because of their, their identity, their ethnicity or their nationality, or you are targeting them for um, attack. So in the case of, of crimes against humanity, your political views are not the basis to be um, bombed, killed, put under siege, persecuted, denied fundamental rights of movement, of life, of education, of, of family. Um, so your political opinion, and I, and I have no idea what the political opinion is of the child who was killed um, under rubble in Northern Gaza or the child who was killed in a convoy trying to find safety to the south of Gaza as instructed by Israel and then bombed by Israel. Um, political opinion does not make you a target um, under international law, under common sense, frankly. Thanks, uh, uh, thanks Catherine. Um, Jamil, I, I want to quote for you uh, the words of a White House spokesman who uh, publicly rebuked Israel following an Israeli airstrike in Gaza that targeted a Hamas leader, uh, but that also killed uh, more than a dozen civilians, including children. Uh, this is what the White House spokesman says. He says, the heavy-handed action, this heavy-handed action does not contribute to peace. This message has been conveyed to Israeli authorities and the United States regrets the loss of life. Uh, I believe later on uh, actually referred to the possibility of war crimes um, that this spokesman used that term. So this message, I'm sorry, th these words were not 
made by the current White House of uh, Joe Biden, but by a spokesperson for the George W. Bush administration uh, uh, 21 years ago. Yet over the past 28 days, we've seen precisely the same kinds of attacks on a much larger scale uh, carried out across Gaza. And yet we've seen um, not seen any criticism uh, of these kinds of tactics, either by the United States or by, uh, frankly, European powers. Um, this would suggest that maybe there were red lines that existed in the past, but the, uh, they don't uh, exist any longer. Um, and if that's the case, what does this mean for the whole notion uh, of international humanitarian law and the, the laws of war um, and this broader idea of a rules-based international order? Um, thank you, Khalid, for this question, because it, it kind of really um, reminds us how even the United States government, uh, during the one of the worst times of the modern U.S. history after 9-11 and the responses to 9-11, which were devastating to, to millions of people uh, around the world, um, even, even then, they had made, uh, they condemned such act of the attack on uh, Salah Shahadi in, in, in the Gaza Strip, uh, who was, by the way, the head of... Uh, alleged to be the head of the Azadin Qassam, one of the military leaders of Azadin Qassam brigades. Um, and the I think that what happened since then, there are a number of things. One is something that the Israeli government has pushed for before 9-11 and have mm -hmm. used to try to erase those distinctions between civilians and combatants to reframe or re-adjust um, and to suggest a formulation of international humanitarian law that would be more favorable to the, the Israeli government and its military operations and violence vis-a-vis uh, -vis the Palestinians and not only Palestinians, because it was used outside the territory of, the, of, of Israel, uh, outside meaning outside the West Bank and the Gaza Strip, et cetera, with extraterritorial attacks on individuals outside a conventional Com, com, uh, armed conflict or battlefield, and that has that notion of uh, redefining the laws of war, redefining what the laws of you on the uh, particularly the the standard of use of force under international law, both under the UN Charter, as was explained uh, eloquently by Katie, and also under international human rights law. This push for redefining what are the limits of the use of force have been adopted by by um, the US over time, uh, not necessarily right after 9-11. I mean, there were, of, of course, a lot of things that happened very rapidly, but we've seen that uh, uh, happening in, in a way that even the, the categorization of certain people that fall outside the protection of any law, what we call an unlawful enemy combatant, it was Israel that really first law that was enacted, unlawful enemy combatant law that passed by the Knesset, that, that was intended to, to hold individuals, mainly Hezbollah leaders, as bargaining chips in order to free or to get information on military uh, personnel, Israeli soldiers who were either fall, uh, killed or taken captured. And th that sort of legal regime that Israel was trying to push was by and large adopted uh, by the United States, not by many other countries. There was a still a international consensus, uh, both on the issue of the use of force, and we've seen many countries uh, m making very clear their objection to the lack of any protection of IHL um, in the context of the Gaza uh, use of force uh, and attacks and violence by, by Israel. And so one other thing that's important to mention is the notion that the Israeli government uses the term uninvolved uh, persons. They, they don't say civilians, they, they don't necessarily, they, they say uninvolved person. We, we are going to take any precaution to not harm any involved persons. And we know from even litigation that we were, we were in, in Israeli courts that uh, Israeli military commanders testified that in a time of war, there are no civilians. I was one of the co-counsel in the, in the civilian litigation on behalf of Rachel Corey's family, 
and we had a testimony of a military commander on the on uh, under oath saying, uh, and we can check it out. We had put out statement on that. So there are no civilians in in that sort of sense, and there the laws of war really didn't matter as much. I think there is um, going into a very dangerous zone where there are no rules at all, and that's where you I think your your comment about where what is where does it lead us. And I think there are a number of things that happen. Not only that the United States has agreed to and continues to agree to these uh, squeed, screwed uh, interpretation, distorted interpretation of international law and use of force, and uh, IHL in particular in the so-called global war on terror. I think we see that the Israeli government is pushing the US to adopt another country, to adopt the idea that this is a fight against uh, terrorism. It's a fight just like the fight against ISIS. And just like I agree with Raz about that, the harm, the harm, harm to weaponization of the Holocaust in the way of framing this, that is as if that the Palestinians are a Nazi power. Uh, I also want to raise uh, really concerns about the framing as if this is a war on terror. I think that is a framing that not only decontextualize what is happening. But it also leads to what have we have seen after 9-11. And although President Biden told Netanyahu, don't make the mistakes that we made, uh, I think that they're clearly are uh, trying to win uh, on both, uh, both, uh, um, both sides. Meaning on one hand, U.S. is saying, we give you an unlimited and unrestricted military aid and weapons. And we will continue to defend you diplomatically and politically internationally on the under the guise of self-defense. But we're also going to raise just as a matter of protecting ourselves from the legal liability that I think is there are many people within the Biden administration are concerned about with regard to what that means for the United States providing that support and the complicity that is uh, is impl the implications of complicity there. I think that is some of the things that not only we will have dangerous implications on other parts of the world, because this is exactly what the U.S. was warning against in Ukraine, but in other places. And yet they are standing behind a, a, a military actions that crossed all red lines and that have clearly went to not only, as stated before, and the war crimes, the crimes against humanity, but even worse. Uh, so they think they what we have to really be paying attention here is not not only about the framing, but also about the legal responsibilities. I was happy to see the ICC prosecutor jo uh, come to the Rafah cross point and he wasn't able to get in, but finally speak out. He should be speaking more forcefully on this. I just heard yesterday that the Israeli government is preparing the establishment of a special court to try um, Hamas uh, fighters and others involved in the attacks on the October 7th, similar to the ISIS special tribunal or the special tribunal that was created uh, after uh, uh, World War II to try Nazi war criminals. I think, again, this is this is uh, not something that the U.S. should be standing up. It should be clear what the accountability should look like, and they should make it clear both on the assistance uh, the military and diplomatic assistance, as well as on the setting, what are the the rules of of war and what are the rules of engagement in this case, and that um, this this is going to give us to a point where this will be the rules of the jungle, as uh, our friend and colleague Raja Surani has has for decades warned from Gaza, where his home was bombed, uh, and he safe uh, fortunately was safe. He was always saying, "What is our other?" alternative. Uh, the alternative to the laws of war and the protection of humanity at all times is the rules of the jungle. And I think the United States will be making a terrible mistake in, in continuing with this form of uh, 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 double speak and hypocrisy when it comes to allowing Israel to commit those serious grave crimes and atrocities, while at the same time uh, suggesting that it is caring for civilian uh, protections and the Palestinian civilian population. Thanks. And I think we're going to dig into some of that again in, in subsequent questions. So thank you for that. Raz, I want to come back to you. 
Um, in the early days of this war, which feels like a uh, hundred years ago, but was really two and a half weeks ago when you wrote this, I think, you published a piece in Jewish Currents in which you described the assault on Gaza as, quote, a textbook case of genocide unfolding in front of our eyes, unquote. Um, I think at the time that was something that caused a lot of controversy and consternation. I would say now, three and a half weeks into this, there is still controversy over the use of the term genocide. Can you talk about what you meant by, by what you put in this article and, and what led you to this conclusion? And, and if you want to contend with any of the arguments out there saying that this is the wrong conclusion, that would be great too. Yeah, I mean, I, uh, I think that uh, the convention, the UN Genocide Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide from 48 requires for the crime of genocide, special intent to destroy um, a group as such, that is the targeting of members of the group as members of the group, not just uh, as individuals. And I think that and this is what prompted me to, to write this piece. Uh, and again, I think that we have to understand Israeli political leader, state leaders, and senior army officers have made and are continuing to make, by the way, explicit proclamations about this kind of intent to destroy. And this is very unique because we know that perpetrators of genocide, right, don't express themselves in this way. We have these statements in this case because Israelis are now living in a world in which they are fighting Nazis. This is the reason that we're seeing this, because, of course, if we're fighting Nazis, then no rules apply. There is no law. There is nothing. There is just good and evil, as Biden framed it when he arrived in Israel, right? Pure, unadulterated evil, right? So this is the reason that we have the intents. Now, the, the, the proclamations are very clear. I, you know, it's worthwhile just for a minute to, uh, uh, to go over some of them again. Israeli President Herzog said explicitly, every, I'm, I'm not quoting him directly, but he said, everyone, all the nation uh, uh, in Gaza, right, are responsible for the Hamas attack. That takes 2.2 million people and turns all of them into legitimate targets, right? Explicitly, he, he did not go back on the statement, by the way, since then. It's very notable, right? Um, um, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu uh, said that Israel will turn uh, uh, Gaza into rubble. Um, uh, Israel Defense Minister Galant, as we know, his uh, infamous total siege proclamation on 9th of October, and it's worth noting that total, Gallant may have coined a new term, right, with total siege in the way that he used it. So taking the 16-year-old siege of Gaza and turning it into intensifying it. Again, we have to remember all this is within a frame of long-term processes that we can't ignore them, right? Turning it into a total siege. And it's worthwhile here also to note that Israel can come and say, well, the carpet bombings have military rational and of course the way that they're conducted they have no military rational whatsoever, but the cutting off of food and water to 2.2 million people has no military rational. That's, in the language of the convention, measures calculated to bring about the destruction of a group, right? Uh, Army, Israeli Army spokesperson Daniel Agari said in the first days, again, noting himself the number of bombs that Israel has dropped, as you said, Katie, on one of the most densely populated areas on earth, right, said that uh, uh, Gaza will turn into a city of tents and there will be no buildings there. And then emphasizing that the point is destruction and not accuracy himself, right? So I, what I invite critics of the, of, the, of the use of the concept of genocide now to do is to tell us how they don't see the special intent in all these proclamations taken together, right? I think that they are very clear proclamations of special intent, each and every, and these are people who have command authority, right? Israeli media and social media are awash in annihilatory language, awash of calls for a second Nakba. There are signs hanging from freeways calling for starvation, annihilation, deportations. Anyone who follows Hebrew language sources today and has, has some sense that we are talking about people here is deeply, deeply shocked, right? But we are talking about people with command authority. That's what constitutes the special intent to destroy. 
I invite the critics to come and show us, don't tell us this is not genocide. That's not an argument, right? Tell us how this doesn't constitute, what does it constitute then, taken together, right? Engage in the argument in a serious way. Don't just push it aside. Tell us how this, this, this not, because for me, if you're putting in a, 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 if you're imposing a total siege, if you're calling all the Palestinians in Gaza, putting them as legitimate uh, targets, if you are admitting the scale of destruction, right? And we're seeing the scale of destruction in front of our eyes. This is, this is, this indeed, uh, in my view, uh, constitutes to, um, special intent. We're also having, of course, the, the extremely dehumanizing and demonizing language. Gallant called the Palestinians explicitly human animals. The language of Nazis is an integral part of the of this dehumanizing uh, um, assault. And one last thing that I'll just say about the issue of genocide. Genocide, the, the convention, the way I see it, has two normative elements. One is punishment, which is very important, right? But one is prevention, right? Now, again, prevention sends us into the realm of historical processes, right? So it takes us away, in a way, a bit from international law. But this is what, I'm, what I want to say here, I think, is incredibly important because we're seeing in Israel today, I mean, uh, uh, an, an intensification of assault in the West Bank that's not receiving at all the kind of attention that it should be receiving, right? An intensification of ethnic cleansing and the destruction of whole communities. But we're also seeing an intensification of attack against Palestinian citizens of Israel, one fifth of the, of the state's uh, citizens who are now also, so this idea that all the Palestinians in Gaza are basically enemies, right? Is stretching also to, to, to look at Palestinian Israelis in this way. And this is again, not new at all, right? But also the discourse, the dehumanizing and demonizing discourse is, and again, anyone who follows Hebrew language sources sees this, right? Is stretching to them. Now we've, we've seen this in the past, civilian population, citizens of a state, defined, citizens of the state here defined as enemies with dehumanizing discourse, that's Rwanda actually. And I want to remind everyone that the US government, while we were all witnessing genocide in Rwanda in 1994, was very concerned at telling us that this is not genocide. So this is very important to remember. Thanks, Roz. Um, Catherine, I, I'd like to come to you and just to, just to uh, remind folks, uh, we only have about 20 minutes left. And so if you could um, try to keep uh, your answers as concise as possible, because so, we do have um, uh, another round of questions. Um, but Catherine, I, I want to come to you. Um, your organization, the Center for Constitutional Rights, recently published a 44-page brief claiming um, uh, basically the same thing that, that Roz has told us, uh, quote, there is a credible case based on uh, powerful evidence that Israel is attempting to commit, if not actively committing, genocide against the Palestinian people in the Gaza Strip. Um, the brief goes on uh, to, uh, to state that a uh, plausible and credible case uh, uh, is to be made that the United States' actions uh, to further the Israeli military operation closure and campaign against the Palestinian population in Gaza rise to the level of complicity in the crime uh, under international law. Um, can you explain to us uh, why CCR uh, believes that the U.S. bears responsibility and what consequences, if any, that might uh, carry for, for U.S. officials? Sure. Um, and CCR put out that that emergency briefing paper already on October 18th. Um, and to see what has happened since then, I think any doubt that we expressed in that um, report is is gone. Um, what drove us to to do that and to take this frame was our longstanding work on accountability for. Um, violations against the Palestinian people by Israeli officials with U.S. complicity. And so going back for um, a number of decades, this has been a part of, of CCR's work. And what we have seen over the years is what Jamil described earlier in the post 9-11 period. We've seen an escalation of, of harms the collective punishment against the entire Palestinian population of Gaza being described as the enemy, being described as terrorists, 
Um, we've seen this before and we've seen it ratcheting up in the number of deaths, the stranglehold on the, the entire population. So when we started to hear immediately um, the statements by Israeli officials about clearing out Gaza, about human animals, um, about destruction, we knew that Israeli leaders say what they mean and then do what they say. And in this case, those statements uh, that were promised, we have seen them now bearing out in action. And what we then looked at is what is the United States doing when it hears these statements? What did it do on October 9th? What did it do on October 11th? When it heard no, the total siege language, when it heard the order of, of evacuation of half of Gaza, a closed tiny area under aerial bombardment continually and forcing over a million people to leave to where? It kept providing support and providing support in every way, in, in language, promises, um, assertions, trips by the President of the United States, by the Secretary of Defense, by the Secretary of State, Blinken, Austin, Biden, all showed up and said, we are here with you and we will give you what you need. And they did not say, but we didn't like what we heard. They said, we will give you what we need. And as the title of this webinar is, no red lines. And so they didn't just say it, they then backed it up. They brought um, aircraft carriers to the area. They sped up the delivery of weapons. I think it's important to remember that the US already has stockpiles of weapons in Israel for Israel's use. $4.4 billion of stockpiled weapons are already there in addition to the, the military that Israel gets. But the US didn't just rely on what it had given before, it continued to provide military support, ammunition, um, defensive capabilities, all of this while hearing this language of genocide. Um, it also provided diplomatic cover. When there was pressure finally for a ceasefire that, that was growing, the United States pushed back and it continued to say, no red lines, we will be there. You have a right to defend yourself against this occupied territory with a, a civilian population under siege and bombardment. Um, and so we, we moved very quickly to look at genocide. In the past, we've looked at war crimes. In the past, uh, I worked with Palestinian human rights organizations and putting forward to the prosecutor of the International Criminal Court a submission on the closure of Gaza as the crime against humanity of persecution. I believe that was already seven years ago and no action has been taken on it. So we saw that it's it's we're in a different moment and we need the appropriate frame. And as Ra said, one of the key features of the genocide convention is that it includes the duty to prevent. And under International Court of Justice jurisprudence, a state that has the ability to influence a state that is carrying out genocide must act as soon as it's on notice. So when we had the language of the total siege on October 9th or of the mass evacuation on October 11th, the United States was on a duty to act to prevent genocide. And instead it's furthering it, it's assisting it. And so there is a breach already of its duty to prevent and then when you look at the law of complicity in genocide, and that is a standalone crime under the Genocide Convention, as is attempt, um, we see that the United States fits that by sending weapons, by giving aid, assistance, encouragement, procurement of, of the means by which to commit genocide. So there is, unfortunately, it gives me, it, it's terrifying to me, that I say this with confidence, there is a case of, of complicity in genocide by the government of the United States, including its senior officials, Biden, Blinken, and Austin. And genocide being a international crime, it can be investigated by the ICC, and it can also be investigated um, and prosecuted under national laws around the world. And we also have a criminal statute here in the United States. 
So if we didn't have a complicit government, we should be seeing prosecutions, in fact, for complicity in genocide here. Thanks, Catherine. And I think it's worth adding that yesterday the House passed um, what is the first effort now to get Israel $14.3 billion in additional um, U.S. Um, military aid. Um, and that's going to be that's being held up, but not because there isn't unanimous support for the aid for Israel. It's being held up because there's partisan battles about other things attached to it or related to it. Um, Jamil, I want to come back to you. And again, I'm going to remind people to be brief because we want to get after Jamil to one more round. Um, you referenced before the issue of displacement. I want you to talk more about that. The you know we've seen the forced displacement of 1.4 million Palestinians to southern Gaza. Um, many Palestinians, we understand, view, view this as a prelude to another mass expulsion or a Nakba. Um, I think one could argue those fears are quite obviously not unfounded, not only because of the history that Palestinians have with Israel, but also given the growing talk in Israeli government circles and in pundit circles, which really are, are suggesting that a large number of Palestinians could be or should be pushed across the border into Sinai or even beyond it further in the region. I want to point out that last week, there was a leak from the Ministry of Intelligence of a Ministry of Intelligence uh, directive or opinion, basically making the case for doing exactly that. Prior to that, there was a leak or not a leak. There was a publication of a right wing um, Israeli think tank making the case that this is a unique opportunity. October 7th was a unique opportunity to achieve this this ethnic cleansing of Gaza. They don't use that term. Um, I want you to talk about that. How, how likely is this scenario? in your view and in the forces that are operating against it. I also want to ask you just as you talk about context before, you know, speaking about the US in, in Iraq and all of that, I mean, the distinction between a war that is fought on the ground against um, insurgents versus the war that is fought by a party or military action fought by a party that has territorial aspirations on the ground of which they are fighting um, and how that distinguishes these, these combat situations as well. Yeah, I, briefly, I want to say first, historically, it, we've heard many countries um, that were involved in mass atrocities, including genocide, that have explained or justified their act, acts as a result of military necessity, as a result of uh, the consequences of war effort, uh, and as a consequences of defending or engaging in these military operations from the Armenian genocide and the Turkish government and Turkish kind of alleging that, oh, civilians die and they've been, they died and they have been uh, mis displaced because not because we did that in an orchestrated, organized way, but because we, it was just a matter of wartime. We've heard that in other contexts, unfortunately, over and over, even in the last century. Um, and that that is what is really concerning here. And we're hearing that, as, as Raz mentioned, some of the statements, the statements that we're hearing from both Israeli officials as well as U.S. officials, that in a, in a time of war, civilians uh, killed. In a time of war, things like that happen. And in a way that uh, here, you're getting some sort of justification and explanation that really is so um, abhorrent, but yet that's exactly what, what we've seen in, in other contexts. So it's really important that in the... Palestinian context, we don't have to go that far. You, Palestinians know that not only that the Nakba happened in 1948, and the vast majority of the Palestinian people have been forced to, to uh, uh, outside their homeland and never allowed to return by force uh, using uh, violence against the return of the refugees, including against people who were mis displaced not only in 1948, but also in 1967 war. And not only that the Palestinians have that in their collective memory, and it has impacted their daily lives ever since that happened, but they constantly know that this is also the unfolding ongoing catastrophe, which is Nakba is continuing. And so the, the threat of additional mass displacement, ethnic cleansing is something that is, 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 a, is, is imminent, is real, it's happened in different parts of Palestine, whether it's in East Jerusalem in the Sheikh Jarrah and the using against uh, uh, the notion of Israel, using the notion of we are, um, we have to maintain some sort of demographic balance between Jews and non-Jewish populations in East Jerusalem or in Jerusalem as a whole, Rabati, 
uh, Greater Jerusalem. We've seen that in the context of what happened inside Israel after 48, during the military regime up to 1966. Of course, we've seen it in 67 and, and in all the West Bank policies of settlement, uh, illegal settlement construction, uh, construction, and now they attempt to annex more land and to essentially come to the point where there is a minimum number of Palestinians living uh, under the control and jurisdiction of Israeli authorities. And, and any opportunity that the Israeli government can push out more Palestinians outside their ability to oppose any kind of resistance, uh, it, I think they would be willing to do. And I think that's what we're seeing in the Gaza context, that they are pushing uh, the idea that in order to protect civilians, they have to go to the South, even though the South itself has been bombarded constantly, including the routes as been documented. Uh, they're, and, and under starvation policy, by the way, and the siege that you heard about. But also they were trying to create the idea that if they just move to the other side of the border, to the Egyptian side, they will be protected. And yet that, that is a serious, uh, uh, um, dangerous uh, uh, scenario, which I don't think the Palestinians, and Palestinians understand that that's not going to happen because they know once they are pushed out, it's really hard to come back. It's not that Palestinians don't want to live and don't want to have a safe haven, but they also see that their, their, the alternative of being outside their homeland is is, 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 is something that they would not want to live as seeing the generations of those descendants of refugees. So I think that it's so important that we put that into context. US government so far is saying, and I think I saw uh, Blinken's statement saying that they will not allow such mass displacement outside. They will, but again, there've been more talk um, and lip service to protections of civilians uh, with, but not seeing enough pushback and restrictions and limitations and, and objections to Israeli actual um, uh, policies and actions, particularly as the, the ground invasion and, 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 and reoccupation, I would say, or uh, further goes into Gaza, they will see more and more attempts to, to try to push Palestinians out. So I think that is imminent. That is a grave violation of international humanitarian law. It is consistent with the the uh, what you just heard from from uh, from Raz and Katie about the not only the prevention of the crime of, of torture but uh, of, of genocide, uh, but also the consequence will be a criminal act that would be uh, have a serious consequence under international law. Uh, I think that that's where uh, the international community has been pushing for ceasefire <clears throat> in order to allow for this kind of uh, actions to stop, not only to to take a break uh, uh, for humanitarian assistance, but also to to really provide the protection for civilian populations in in Gaza. Th thanks, uh, thanks, Jamil. Um, so uh, we we are going to go a little bit over because we uh, we want to get to this uh, final round of questions. Um, uh, Jamil, it's it's interesting what you what you were saying, and and one thing I've noticed in um, in the, the the kinds of questions that I typically get from reporters, for example, they come in waves, and you can usually tell what uh, Israeli government talking points are by the nature of the questions, because they they tend to be uniform. And the nature of the questions this week um, that I'm getting are, uh, why can't Arab states take uh, the refugees? Why can't they uh, take Palestinian refugees? So. Um, it's quite, I think, uh, indicative of, of where Israeli government thinking is. Um, so, as I said, in this final round, I want to ask you all to please be as concise as you possibly can, uh, maybe two, three minutes each. Um, Raz, I want to come back to I want to come to you on uh, something that you uh, you talked about the need for both prevention and accountability. I want to ask you to break that down a little bit for us, uh, assuming that the U.S. and European powers um, have either abdicated their responsibilities in terms of, of, of prevention uh, or are actively uh, participating or complicit in, in what's happening. Um, what recourse is there for Palestinians, uh, both in terms of, of prevention and accountability, and who should be pursuing those? So, so what is possible and, and by whom? Um, is it the Palestinian leadership in, in Ramallah? Is it at the United Nations? Uh, who, 
who can uh, 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 intervene in this process in, in a meaningful way? So, uh, you know, I, I, I wanna uh, very briefly here, as you said, uh, uh, but say one first thing, I wanna highlight a thing, something that uh, uh, Nora Arakat uh, said on uh, two days ago in the Palestine Festival of Literature in New York in a very, very powerful speech that I encourage everyone to, uh, to listen to. She said that the criminality of the uh, Israeli state attack now and the response in the West uh, to it, which is complicit uh, uh, completely, means that uh, we're, we're, ne we're entering a new stage basically where everywhere around the world is becoming more unsafe, right? Many, many places around the world are unsafe. Now, well, we'll see even more places being unsafe, right? This lack of accountability and this complicity with a, with a clear, clear case of state criminality and, and genocide, I argue. So this is one thing, this is not just about uh, um, Palestine, the struggle against this is not just about Palestine, it's very much about Palestinians. But this is a this should be a shared human responsibility, right? And and the response should be on a global scale. Now, more to the point, you know, I I I just want to comment that it's very important. In my view, the international legal system after World War II, as it is today, is based on the idea that the Holocaust was unique. This uniqueness then tells us one of the implications of the idea of the Holocaust is unique is that Jews are unique. And Israel as a self-proclaimed Jewish state is also unique. And in this way, the, the impunity that Israel has enjoyed for decades is baked into the system from the very beginning. And that's why, as Katie said, there are so much evidence. There is a large body of evidence of crimes against humanity, apartheid crimes, uh, persecution, uh, war crimes, nothing, right? Total, complete impunity, right? And we're all witnessing this for decades. Now, now we're, uh, uh, that, and that's why the ICC prosecutor arrived at the border, I think, of Gaza and Egypt, because everything is so clear and in front of our eyes and explicit and unashamed that everyone is feeling that the system is shaking now, right? The only way, right, to salvage some of this system, right, um, is to take seriously now the crimes we see clearly unfolding in front of our eyes. So it's a moment, I think, of it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a watershed moment, right, for the international legal system. And I truly hope that the ICC pr prosecutor will make the right decision and move forward, not just with the investigation and prosecution of the 7th of October mass atrocities, which he definitely should, right, but also the genocidal assault that followed it, right? This will be a watershed moment because it will break this structural impunity. Uh, um, and then many opportunities can open up for a different kind of future. Thanks, Raz. Jamil, I want to come back to you. Um, and, and you mentioned the word ceasefire in your last answer, and I want to drill, drill down into that for a second. There is one red line that is being talked about in the world. It's being talked about by all the major human rights organizations, all the major civil society groups, by the grassroots activists. Um, there seems to be um, more activism than than and, and and more organization around this idea that we have to have a ceasefire on this I, I, it, it seems almost unprecedented the engagement um but the major powers most notably Israel and the US but also Germany and France and the UK are resisting um and the Biden administration and others basically argue that now is not the time for a ceasefire. They're willing to talk about things like humanitarian pauses. I'm not sure about the legal definition of that. You might want to talk about that for a second. But they say that a ceasefire would only benefit Hamas. Can you just talk about this argument? Um, I, I think I want to start with that this approach is a racist approach to because we, there's nothing else to explain that, that the the demonization, dehumanization that we're seeing, and the fact that even though the numbers and the numbers are being contested, also for uh, those reasons that we know, it usually come from those kind of uh, suspicion about the credibility of of people who are who are not part of us in the Western liberal. Like you know, you have to have to be confirmed by the World Health Organization how many people that died or killed in in Gaza. But the fact that you are talking about uh, forty percent at least of the those killed civilians are children. Some of them are still under rubble. Uh, and the, yet, what we are hearing is that this is about 
pro, uh, uh, benefiting Hamas, the ceasefire will only benefit Hamas. I mean, tells you something about the the uh, the, the attitude that individuals and institutions, both in the U.S. and Israel and other countries, are very few countries that supported, stood with with Israel and the U.S. at the General Assembly against ceasefire, tells you something about how they value. Palestinian civilians and Palestinian uh, rights in general. And I think that is a fundamental, it's going to be, as Raj said, going to have in, not just an issue for Palestinians, but in other contexts where uh, certain lives don't matter as much, don't, don't have the same value as civilian protections. And that is something that I think we need to address it head on. Uh, I think that the, the administration is both taking into account domestic politics into the calculation, which is, again, a very dangerous thing when you're talking about uh, lives of civilians. If you just compare the numbers, I've received a chart about between Ukrainian, uh, the casualties in the Ukrainian war and the, what's happening in Gaza and Palestine, in Palestinian uh, casualties or civilians since it's staggering. The, the, and yet, and, and the, the, the upside down kind of uh, distorted way of thinking about it, as if that, the Palest all of a sudden, Israel and Ukraine are on, on one side, and the freedom, free, uh, civilized uh, societies versus the forces of darkness. That language and that attitude is something that needs to be rejected immediately. The U.S. government, we know when they address mass atrocities, they know how to, it triggers things within the government. We've seen that happening in different parts of the world. And yet we've seen also reports just recently from Huffington Post um, revealing that they were um, sidelining voices of people within the State Department and trying to elevate concerns about civilian protection. We know that there are uh, those who are trying to, and there were some people who even resigned from the US, US government. I think rejecting ceasefire right now is, is a, complicity amounts to complicity to additional war crimes and crimes against humanity and and even genocide there's no other way to put it i think that it's not about protecting hamas hamas is there as both military arm and political institution those who don't know the history of what happened there they need to be need to study this uh particularly about the role of hamas and how it evolved again i reject that you have to put hamas as as a par with ISIS or Al Qaeda, uh, and and I, I reject obviously the the as we discussed earlier that it is a Nazi uh, uh, has a Nazi ideology. Hamas does violate international humanitarian law grave in a grave and brutal way, and we've seen that on October seventh. But that doesn't really mean that we we lose sight of what is happening in that context. And if we lose sight of the context and the history of what is going on and the the people's right to live freely and with dignity. We will not be able to solve any of the other issues that are happening around the world. And I echo the concerns about the legitimacy of the international legal system. It is uh, been uh, decimated by Israeli and US push against civilians. And that has to be something that we have to reckon with. Without that, very minimum protections. I mean, the enforcement of international laws of war is very been very much weakened over the years, and it 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 it, it really something that U.S. Did, it, it helped to do, and particularly with regard to the weakening the ICC, while also pushing for other uh, kinds of uh, accountability when it suited United States policy, both domestically and 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 internationally. So I think it's a really a, a moment of reckoning and a moment of recognizing that we can't get out of this without taking into account the historical context the rights of all people who are living there and not to be stuck in the moment of October 7. That's what I think the U.S. government is trying to do with, his, with the U.S. government, is that don't think about what happened before October 7 and don't think about what happened after October 7. We only want you to think about what happened October 7 because only Israeli civilians have the, the entitled to, to being uh, protected and, and those crimes need to be, to be prosecuted and, and held accountable for. But other things that are, you're seeing, is only our own defense and only in the way that we can uh, terrorize other people and civilians in the name of, of self-defense, in the name of protecting Israel as self-defined Jewish democracy. 
Uh, thanks, Jamil. Uh, Catherine, you're going to have the last word, and, I, and I'd like to ask you to address the same question of uh, or questions about prevention and, and accountability, maybe specifically focusing on, uh, on the role of the United States or U.S. actors. Um, what recourse is there? I mean, we, we know, for example, there's, there's a considerable amount of dissent within the administration. Um, there's a lot of pushback, but we also know that a lot of people who are raising these concerns inside the administration at state, for example, human rights, uh, you know, in, in the Human Rights Bureau or in other places are being sidelined, at least according to uh, recent press reports. Is there a role that folks inside the administration can play? Is this something that they need to take on personally? Uh, you know, there have been a couple resignations. Should there be more? Uh, uh, is there some way to move the needle? Um, uh, on the thinking here. Um, thank you. you. You dropped off at the end, but just on the, the question of, of what people in the administration can do or what any of us can do, I think everyone at this moment has a responsibility to act. And so for those in government, I do think this is a moment for deep consideration of resignations. If you are not being heard, the public needs to hear what you are trying to say, and that maybe will have an effect on, on what the administration is doing. I think the mass protests that we've already seen, and there's going to be a very, very significant protest in Washington this Saturday, those need to continue. Um, we need to see more members of Congress ex not only expressing concern about US complicity and, and civilians, but actually stopping, taking proactive steps to stop the support and we need to see action at the International Criminal Court. We did see the prosecutor go to Rafa, but the, the prosecutor of the ICC has been seized with the situation of Palestine since 2015. It's been eight years. And the reason why the ICC was seized with, the, with Palestine was particularly to respond to the 2014 military assault, the 51-day military assault that led to the death of over 2,200 Palestinians, including over 550 children. And if the ICC is still doing a review of that case file eight years on, we are, we're in trouble because it's taking the wrong approach. What we need to see from the ICC at this moment is arrest warrants. We heard the prosecutor speak about the principles of distinction and the principles of proportionality, and so did I. At this point, though, what we are seeing is an attack against a civilian population and whether Prosecutor Khan wants to look at it through the lens of the crime against humanity, of, of murder, of extermination, of persecution, or whether he wants to look at it through the lens of genocide. It's imperative that he look at it through the, the lens of an attack against an entire civilian population. There is a state apparatus by Israel with support, aiding and abetting by other states, state officials, individual criminal responsibility is what you have at the ICC. Um, and I think it needs to be looked at for the forest and not look at incident by incident, each individual, um, is, each individual act because then you are stuck in the same cycle. And what we have seen is that Israel has taken that impunity and they have run with it. They have ramped it up with the next military assault. And, and we're in a terrifying moment where we don't know what will be left of Gaza. Um, and there needs to be action and there needs to be action now. And the only other thing I would put out there is the International Court of Justice that has jurisdiction over um, actions between states for enforcing the Convention Against Genocide. We've seen this um, precautionary me measure sought in the case of the genocide against the Rohingya. I think that is another venue that is one that deserves serious consideration, not only for commission, but for complicity as well. All right. Thank you so much. I think we're going to end it there. We could go on for another hour. I'm pleased we only overran by 10 minutes. So well done, everybody. Um, a tremendous amount. Um, we were able to cover a tremendous amount. There's a lot more to cover. So maybe we'll ask you back for part two at some point. 
for now, we're going to end it here. Um, so thank you so much for making time for this conversation, Catherine, Jamil, and Raz. And Khaled, it's an honor, as always, to co-moderate and co-convene with you and MEI. Thank you to everyone who joined us live or is watching or listening to this event after the fact. Please check out the websites of the Foundation for Middle East Peace and the Middle East Institute of www.fmep.org, www.mei.edu for video and audio of this program and a, uh, a compendium of resources to go along with it, uh, as well as information about other programs that we'll be having um, now and in the future. And with that, we'll end it here. Thank you very much.